let me now start the seventh uh, section of our conference and now i give uh, the floor uh, to sonia bella baba please the floor is yours thank you so much i'm very happy to be here and thank you for inviting me to this conference i've been listening carefully for two days and there were so many interesting papers uh, so i was really enjoying it uh, so, my name is Sonia Bielobaba. I am a senior lecturer at the Department of Mon Modern Languages uh, in Serbian, Croatian and Bosnian. Uh, but I also work as a researcher at Center for Research Ethics and Bioethics, both of them at Uppsala University in Sweden. Um, and besides that, I'm Vice President of the European Network for Academic Integrity, or ENI, and I'm going to talk about it, that network as well a bit later in my speech. Uh, but the speech is concepted uh, like this. I, it has five parts, academic integrity, research, organizational education and network. Some of these slides were disseminated in previous presentations. Uh, as researcher in academic integrity, it's always important to show that if you are self-plagiarizing, but I'm putting this in a new context. So bear with me, please. Okay. First part, academic integrity. I always, almost always start with this slide because I think it's very peculiar how we define academic integrity. Because normally when you define something, you ought to tell people what that is. But when it comes to academic integrity, we are not really good at that. We always define it like by saying what it is not. We tell our students it's no exam cheating, no plagiarism, no collusion, no falsification, no fabrication, no contract cheating. So we are usually defining academic integrity by what it is not. And if we define academic integrity in this way, then it's quite uh, normal that we give our students a piece of paper when we want them to know something about academic integrity, and we write on that paper, please don't cheat, don't, no plagiarism, don't coll no collusion, no falsification, no fabrication. And I don't think that that is the most productive approach to academic integrity, because when you define academic integrity by what it is not, you focus on prohibition and correction of students' behavior. And we focus on how to find students, how to detect them, we focus on punishment. But we never teach students what to do instead. We just assume that they know what academic integrity is and how they are supposed to behave at the university. And that's not always the case. Of course, there are other definitions of academic integrity. Uh, in International Center for Academic Integrity defines it uh, as a commitment, even in the face of adversity, to six fundamental values. Honesty, trust, fairness, respect, responsibility and courage. So the focus is on the values, how students should behave, and not only students, but even other members of the uh, academia. Uh, European Network for Academic Integrity defines it as compliance with ethical and professional principles, standards and practices by individuals or institutions in education, research and scholarship. Uh, and I highlighted here individuals or institutions just to show that it's not only about students, it's about, about both individuals, teachers and students and researchers. And it's also institution as a whole. So that's what I'm going to talk about today, this holistic approach. How can we approach academic integrity in many different levels? Because I think that's what's needed uh, when you deal with this. Uh, I would also like to point out that actually academic integrity is a key competence for sustainable development. Because uh, if you look at sustainable development goals published by the UN, uh, there are several goals that are related to academic integrity, even if people are not talking specifically, the word, words academic integrity are not named. Uh, but uh, goal number four is about quality of education, and you can't have quality of education without academic integrity. Uh, goal number nine is talking about enhancing scientific research and academic integrity and research integrity are, of course, closely connected. 
uh, goal number nine is talking about reducing corruption, also a part of academic integrity. But actually, none of these goals, life in, uh, um, in the sea or anything else, can't be achieved without having students that are behaving according to the values of academic integrity. So that's why I call it a key competence of sustainable development. When we change the definition of academic integrity, we shift the focus to the preventive and pedagogical promotion of academic integrity. So we teach students what to do instead before they do some form of misconduct. And how do we teach academic integrity? Well, in many places, uh, we are trying to make an easy so to do some, some sort of easy solution. We give students a policy that says, okay, you, you are not supposed to do any plagiarism, or we get, give them an honor code that they can sign, that they are going to behave according to the values. Um, in some places, we give them one lecture on academic integrity. Uh, but usually that simple solution is not enough. So I don't think that's a good idea either. Uh, but let's look at some research first and how to organize things before we go, get back to education. Uh, this is number of disciplinary measures at universities in Sweden. And as you can see, it has risen sharply, especially in 2020. And I know that for 2021, it's going to be an even higher state here. And when we look at uh, these disciplinary measures, uh, we can realize that not all of them are accurate. There is a pretty large amount of teachers that do not report. I have done uh, some research uh, previously at Gothenburg University that says that more than 80% of teachers have seen signs of plagiarism in student work, but only 90% did something about it. And only 15% at the time followed the procedure and reported students to the disciplinary board. So under-reporting to the disciplinary board is quite common and teachers often try to solve it in other way uh, by for instance, just giving a fail mark to, to students or talking to students or, or doing something else, but not reporting it because it's quite a process in Sweden, at least. I think it's getting better. So more students, more teachers, teachers are more aware of this problem, um, but it's still, there, there is some under-reporting. Uh, when we look at what type of these disciplinary measures at universities in Sweden are, uh, then you can see that plagiarism and fabrication always have been the, the biggest problem in Sweden. But that last year, due to Corona, uh, unauthorized collaboration also uh, became a really prominent problem. Uh, there are some others, uh, some other problems like grips and prohibited aids, falsification of documents, disruption of cheating and sexual harassment, but they are not as prominent. So plagiarism and fabrication, that's the most important. Um, reason of uh, being reported to, to the disciplinary board. So what is plagiarism? Uh, I'm taking here the definition of uh, Therese Fishman. Uh, plagiarism occurs when someone uses words, ideas or work products attributable to another identifiable person or source without attributing the work to the source from which it was obtained in a solution, in a situation in which there is a legitimate expectation of original authorship in order to obtain some benefit, credit or gain, which need not be monetary. Um, what is important here is to realize that plagiarism and originality, it's not only about text, you can plagiarize ideas, computer code, music, art, design, choreography, many other areas than only texts, what we normally think of when we talk about plagiarism. Um, and uh, it is important to differentiate that there are different types of plagiarism. We have deliberate plagiarism, where a person simply decides, okay, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to plagiarize deliberately uh, from someone else's work and present it as my own. And it's cheating. It's a question of ethics and law. Uh, in, and which should be punished, of course, uh, but it's also a pedagogical issue. I still think that even here, uh, if we talk to students in advance, perhaps we can, uh, we can make some changes so, so they don't go 
choose this road to deliberately do this. Um, but some part of students are going always going for, to go for it, just decide, okay, I'm, I'm, I'll just try, I'll cheat, I don't have time, I don't want to do this, or for whatever reason. Of course, the worst part of uh, this deliberate type of plagiarism is when they simply buy a text and outsource their coursework uh, to someone else, to a th third part with or without payment. Um, it's usually called contract cheating. Uh, it's Thomas Lancaster and Robert Clark that uh, made this, uh, called it that in 2006. Uh, other names are SMLs, ghostwriting, academic outsourcing. This is a, a picture from one of these sites. I always have sources, but I didn't want to recommend them, so I don't have a source here. I admit that. Uh, but as you can see, they they say they have say that they have the finest writers online, that it's 100% plagiarism free, and they give you a satisfaction guarantee and everything. But the thing is, uh, it's very hard to 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 see that people are buying things because you, they can't be caught by text matching software because this is, this is probably original writing. Uh, so how many students use these essay mills and this type of help, monetary help? Um, there are several studies, uh, but around 3.5% uh, of students. Uh, but what's interesting is when students do it one, once they uh, sometimes they they have tend to do it several times. So if you see that 62 percent, 62.5 percent have uh, done it repeatedly. Uh, in Sweden, uh, it's a bit different. Uh, in, in as a part of a global SMEs survey project uh, where we did service in uh, 22 countries on three continents. Uh, we have seen that the usage of SMEs in Sweden is really much, much less. It, it's really an outlier compared to many other countries. It, uh, we only 0.35 students have admitted that they've used uh, fair, fee, free peer share, sharing sites and almost none of them used SMEs. I think this is about to change. I'm currently doing research on contract cheating in Sweden, and there have emerged, especially during the pandemics, essays that are uh, focusing on uh, Swedish student writing in Swedish language. It's a small language, so that's probably the reason why it hasn't emerged previously, one of the reasons. Um, but uh, even if they don't want to buy it, taking help, unauthorized help from friends or family, uh, is not that uncommon. 4.57% of Swedish students have answered yes on that questions. And this is uh, from 2018. Once again, uh, during the pandemics, probably unauthorized collaboration has emerged as a bigger problem. Besides the problem that's very deliberate, we have inadvertent plagiarism, and it's using someone else's work without giving the proper due to ignorance or carelessness. And this is a pedagogical issue. And this is something we really have to focus on, how we can equip our students to know how to, to reference correctly and not go into this inadvertent plagiarism. Uh, so where are we supposed to do that? When, where, when and how do we teach and deal with academic integrity? Well, I don't think that's enough to do it on the course level only. I don't think that one lecture is enough. I think basically that we have to do it on all levels and have this holistic approach to academic integrity. Uh, first of all, we have several instances normally at universities that might deal with this problem. The problem is they don't communicate with each other. That's the first part I would like to see, that people within universities that teach academic integrity do it together. Perhaps you have some academic integrity unit. You have people working uh, on research ethics and research integrity. You have disciplinary board that's punishing students. You have university library that tries to teach students how to reference correctly. You might have some unit for, units for academic writing that help students if they have questions on academic writing. You might have uh, instances that teach teachers and uh, have teacher training in, for instance, academic integrity. But normally, 
these units work as separate entities and there's a lack of communication between them. So that's the first part I think needs to change. Usually, uh, when people start thinking about this on an organizational level, they try to develop a policy with some clear objectives and values and sometimes very often proactive approach nowadays. So they want to, 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 to incorporate these values. How, how can we teach students in a positive way what to do instead of just punishing them? But as long as you just have a policy, it's just a piece of paper if no one reads that. Besides the policy, it's very important to have an action plan where you have a clear division of roles, who is doing what, and clear procedure, how are we going to work with these questions on academic integrity, a sort of action plan. But still, if you have an action plan and a policy, it's still two pieces of paper, so you need a communication plan. You have to know how to raise awareness and how to have this dialogue, how to make people read these policies and action plans, so it doesn't only stay in, on the piece of paper. Uh, so you need to communicate. You also need to, to think about how to go from the university level to the department level. And the department level is very crucial because you have, they communicate with the university level and they can foster a discussion. They can have their own procedures, how to, for instance, how to report when they find the student has done something inappropriate. They, they need to have uh, the ability to inform students what academic integrity is, because they have contact with students in another way than the university as a whole. It's also important to inform new employees. So it's not enough to do this once. Whenever you get a new colleague, inform the colleague what the procedures are when it comes to academic integrity. And it's also a level where you can involve both students and faculty and administrators to work together to enhance academic integrity. So get, let's get back to education part. So how do and when do we teach academic integrity again? Uh, as I said, there have been uh, lots of, uh, uh, lots of uh, places where we tried to have so, sort of short courses or lectures on academic integrity uh, that you have usually at the beginning of your studies. I've done several of them. This is one for Gothenburg University. In another project, I did it for, uh, for Serbia and for Montenegro uh, as a part of projects I did for, for Council of Europe. And that's very good. I think that's very important, but that's not enough. So I, I did these courses and, and they're, they're really good. They're really useful, but you can't just have one of these courses at the beginning and then just forget about academic integrity and think that your students know everything because they don't. Uh, because this is quite a complex problem. You need to, to have your students that they know uh, law and ethics. They need to know laws, what kind of policy documents they have. Um, you need to teach your students about ethical principles and practices and ethical values, how they should behave. But there's a lot of, lot of skills also that they need to know in order, in order to implement these values. Because uh, many students know they don't want to cheat, but they don't know how to do things properly. They don't know how to write properly. So you need to have these skills as well to di differentiate between good and bad sources, for instance. So they, they know, uh, okay, this is predatory publisher, perhaps I shouldn't use that paper because it's not okay, or Wikipedia, because that's not a good source. Uh, so they need to develop their critical thinking. And of course, they need skills in academic writing. And it takes quite a lot of time to develop skills in academic writing. So that's why that one lecture, or one short course in the beginning is a very good start, but it's not nearly good enough. That it's not enough, really. Um, basically, what I uh, would like to see is that we use academic integrity as a part of all courses. Because what happens quite a lot is that we assess academic integrity in all courses. Uh, so we do this part. And why do I say that we do it in all courses? Well, if your student has plagiarized or bought an essay, uh, that student won't pass that course. But normally, we don't have learning outcomes. We don't have learning activities. 
that are uh, that are talking about academic integrity or developing academic writing skills. So the constructive alignment is not really there. So that's why I think that academic integrity must be clarified as learning ob uh, objectives and you ha must have uh, learning activities and you have to examine academic integrity. Um, and this is not something you should do in just one course, but on all courses, because it is a bit different. We have some different variations when it comes to academic writing in different disciplines. So you have to basically connect academic integrity to your subject. Uh, for instance, when it comes to learning outcomes, just a couple of examples, if you want to read, you can read more about in, in this paper, uh, but learning outcomes uh, on the knowledge on academic integrity on values, on, on information, where, where to find these policy documents. That can be a learning outcome. Knowledge on academic writing. After this course, students will be able to, to, to reference correctly. Knowledge of good research practice on higher levels. So basically, uh, you can see that there is, uh, there might be different types of learning outcomes in different courses. Uh, you might want to have uh, different learning activities on reading. Reading academic texts is quite different than, than reading any other text students might have read previously. So teach them how to read. It's not a novel. They shouldn't read it as a novel. Teach them how to do it properly. Have different learning activities on writing. Learning academic writing takes time. And writing a thesis shouldn't be the first step in that process. Teach students how to do proper, proper referencing. And not only italics, but teach them why they need references and when they are supposed to use references. What's the function of reference? It's that it's supporting their own writing, not just something to show you that they have read so many texts as they have read. Train paraphrasing, because that's the most, um, that's the part that students find really, really hard, how to paraphrase correctly, because what they think paraphrasing is, is just switching to synonyms. And it's not, of course. Uh, that's not enough just to, to change a couple of words, but we don't accept that as a good paraphrasing technique. So show them what's plagiarism, show them patch writing. Patch writing, that's when you change uh, to different synonyms. So they understand the difference between proper paraphrasing and patch writing. Give them feedback. And I know people are going to tell me we have too many things to do, but this is really important to teach your students, to so give them feedback on the referencing technique and on their writing skills. Motivate your students, that's very important. Remind them why they are here, that they're not here just to, to get um, good grades or something, but they are here to, to, in order to, to um, learn something. Uh, and talk about time management, because students are sometimes really, really bad at time management. They, they don't... Uh, realize that when you give them five weeks to do something it's not four weeks of vacation and one week hard work when it comes to assessment assess knowledge and academic integrity so if you have learning outcomes on knowledge and academic integrity assess that knowledge think quite a lot about assessment design i'm a big promoter of formative assessment instead of having one big uh, exam examination at the end of the course because then it takes the edge of this big examination you have at the end. You have small assignments, you have time to make it better. And it makes it easier for students also to keep up. And it's really good when it comes to their time management technique because they, they have to work all the time. Uh, try to, to make your assessments quite original. Don't repeat, of course, your exam, uh, your exam questions, but also try to make it novel, try to make it individual, try to use students and to make it interesting to students uh, so that they can uh, really feel that this is an important exam examination because it takes my experiences seriously. It's also going to be much more fun for you to read that type of examination. Make it a bit complex. Don't make it just one part of examination. Have examination that includes peer review, that excludes, includes making videos, that make comments to each other, and then you can do your final examination. So use peer review quite a lot. That's really good. Uh, focus on the process as well. As we have these essay mills, um, I never would, uh, I, I would never take um, 
a final thesis from a student that I never met before. But focus on the process, make them work and show their work during the process. When I supervise, I usually meet my students quite regularly. And then I know how that this text released their text. Use TMS, text matching software. It's really good. It's not uh, some fantastic uh, magic solution that's going to, to, to show you where plagiarism is, but it is a good tool. They can show you some things. Um, and don't just rely on, okay, if it's under 10%, it's okay. Those percentages mean nothing. Just go and read all these reports and see whether there is plagiarism or not and what the text matching tool is. Uh, telling you, but don't rely on that 100%. Students can still go to the library, take a book and plagiarize from a book that's not digitalized. But if you want to do all of that, you realize that we also need uh, teacher education. So even we that we that work at universities should be educated about academic integrity and should be educated how to incorporate academic integrity into our courses. So this is not only education of students, but also education of teachers. And in Sweden, we have quite a lot of courses, pedagogical courses, teacher training, and uh, um, actually you need to have 15 uh, credits uh, to, to, be, uh, to be able to, to, be, to get hired as a senior, uh, senior lecturer. And uh, if you're going to, to get your habilitation you, and supervise PhD students, you need a course for supervisors in PhD education. In some of those courses, we have, uh, we talk about academic integrity and uh, definitely talk about uh, research ethics. Uh, when it comes to teacher education, as I said, there are mandatory courses for both, uh, super, for both uh, getting hired as a senior lecturer and as a supervisor. Uh, we have also courses in research ethics uh, for teachers. Uh, we have teacher training in academic integrity, and we have quite a lot of workshops and webinars, stuff like this where, where you are now, that can teach you how and make you think and give you uh, advice on how to, to incorporate academic inter integrity in your own courses. Another thing that's important is to involve your students as well. Students are actually very good in, in academic integrity, most of them. 99.999% of students are, are really want to do right, the right thing. So have this open discussion with your students, ask them for ideas. And if they're really good, make them student champions so they can uh, learn more about academic integrity and act as help to other students. Because sometimes it's easier to ask a fellow student than to go to, to teachers. Uh, and an example, here's a student uh, in Sweden that wrote, that was really worried, and she said, she said, or he said, I don't know, he or she, it worries me that there are professional people out in work that lack the skills they claim and are believed to have. It damages the quality of education, then ultimately it is unfair for students who are working hard to become better, they will become the victims of these kind of acts. Why would you cheat when the knowledge you attain at a university is imperative for your future? Cheat enough and sooner or later you will be found out and be both socially and professionally crucified. The only people cheaters cheat are themselves. And I think this really gives us hope that we have students that are this good and, and really thoughtful about academic integrity. So basically, let's go back to the question, how do we teach academic integrity? Yes, I think teacher education and student education across curriculum. So incorporating academic integrity across curriculum in all courses, that, that's the key, basically. And that's the only answer that's not going to have this red cross. Um, one more thing that's important is to avoid educational gaps. Because we, th we, we, we teach our students ethics in several different courses. And I think it's a very good idea to connect academic integrity with other ethics training in order to point out what transferable ethical skills there might be. Uh, I'm currently uh, working in a project, a bridge project, uh, bridging integrity in higher education, business and society. 
It's uh, an Erasmus Plus strategic partnership project. Um, and what we do in this project that started last year is that we are trying to build three bridges. The first one between academic integrity and research integrity. Uh, then the second one uh, from academic integrity towards business ethics and the third one from academic integrity towards citizen science ethics in order to make this holistic perspective of different uh, teaching strategies uh, in, in, uh, uh, and how to connect them better uh, when it comes to ethical education. Uh, the target group are master students and uh, doctoral students and their supervisors at the university and uh, what we are going to do is to create uh, checklists and guidelines uh, for master students, PhD students and uh, the supervisors. Uh, we are going to have uh, different gamified cases and open educational resources um, and we are going to uh, have different uh, workshops and webinars. Uh, so uh, take a look at that. So, uh, and we can get back to you uh, when everything is done. This is just a short, um, so you can see what, what we are up to. Uh, final thing I'm going to talk about, uh, because the Bridge Project is a network of, of uh, six different partners. Networks are really crucial when you want, want to work with academic integrity because it's really good to, to connect different institutions. So it's not only I was talking about institutional organization, but network allows you to, to go beyond your institutions and to connect to, to, to other organizations and see what they are doing when it comes to academic integrity. That all builds the knowledge on academic integrity. And of course, I'm going to talk about European Network for Academic Integrity and invite you all to be members. Uh, so European Network for Academic Integrity started as an Erasmus Plus strategic partnership project with 12 institutions. And currently we have 35 institutions and we are counting, we are getting new members uh, very often. You can read more about us on academicintegrity.eu. And the purpose of this organization, this network, ENI, is to support higher education institutions to work together in the field of academic integrity. Be members as legal, uh, we, we are legal entities engaged in educational activities. Uh, so each member institution appoints representatives. You can also be individual supporter. So if your institution for some reason doesn't want to be a member, you can be a member individual and you can become a member by filling the application form. Um, and then it's approved by the board and you pay a membership fee. That's not really high. Uh, so please join us. I would really like to see more of you there. Um, there are also other networks and I, uh, I don't know if you have any networks in Russia, but it's really a good idea to, to, to develop networks that are national networks uh, in academic integrity, because sometimes we do have national problems uh, that might best be approached by working together on the national level. Um, actually, last week, uh, there's uh, we organized a new network in Sweden, in Sweden called SUNAI, a bit of Japanese name. So Swedish University Network for Academic Integrity. Uh, so that's just an example. So, спасибо за внимание. Thank you so much for attention. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me at sonia.bialababa at cvuu.se. So I, I'm ready to, to uh, uh, ready to here, any questions you might have, I'm going to stop sharing this. Thank you so much. Sonia, thank you for such an interesting intervention. I have uh, my own questions. Firstly, I would I'd like to say that um, we are very happy for your invitation uh, uh, and we're now preparing to take part into the conference uh, in I, uh, in the future, in the next next year, so we are happy uh, to be interesting next year uh, at your conference. Um, uh, as for the questions, you said that online education has led to the um, 
uh, level of uh, to increase, uh, as I, if I may say, in the level of the violations. Do you think this is the only factor, or maybe there is something apart of the pandemic that uh, has uh, influenced the growth? Uh, what do you think? Well, I actually have been teaching online since 2005. So for me, when pandemics came, everything was already set. All my courses were already online. And there is a huge, huge difference between normal online education when, that you have in normal settings and uh, emergency remote teaching, as it has been called. Uh, people had to switch to online courses overnight. And that all posed problems because they tried to, to just switch uh, examination forms that were meant to be on campuses online and it doesn't work. So when I create my courses that are prepared for online teaching, I have totally different type of, of examination or, and assessment than I would have uh, in campus. So that's the main problem because people were not prepared. Then we have also another problem is that students' uh, mental health was really affected as well uh, with everything that was going on. It was really a high, hard period. It still is in many countries. Um, and uh, we have to understand that, that students didn't have someone to, anyone to ask, perhaps. Not all students had the opportunities to, to study at home in a way we just expected them to do. And they tried to cut corners because sometimes it's very hard to ask your teacher about anything and teachers were quite overwhelmed with the situation. So I think it, it really affected, but it's, we shouldn't blame online education for this because online education, when it is done, uh, when you have time to prepare it, it, it works really, really good. And you can have assessment that works. But emergency remote teaching, that, that is a challenge. Uh, thank you, thank you. Another question, you told us about the network, uh, the Sweden network uh, of the for the academic integrity and analyzing uh, the experience I have uh, on the post-Soviet territories, you know, in Russia and other neighboring countries. And uh, sadly, I see that um, the development uh, for the academic integrity, the movement for the academic integrity is very poor. Uh, the only initiative uh, uh, I can remember is the League for Academic Integrity in Kazakhstan. It's a very nice step, uh, but basically is the only this is the only initiative uh, um, that uh, was realized and what do you think uh, who should initiate this kind of uh, work uh, uh, to move it beyond uh, the dead point uh, self-organization in, uh, in the academic uh, sphere is very important right Yes, I, I think that uh, we always have these people that are very, very interested in it. And I always call an I a family because it always, always feels like that because uh, we are a bunch of people that really are interested. We are quite alone uh, in our own universities sometimes, not all of us. We don't have a huge amount of people. Then when we, we gather together, then we see there are like-minded people. But I think that in Russia, that's such a big country, you must have people at all universities that are really, really interested in this question. And if they gather together, then the magic can happen and they can start this movement and work together. So I think uh, and it also can help that they don't feel alone when to discuss this question. So I think uh, it doesn't really matter. There are, there are people that are interested and it's good to, to give them a network so they can work together and find each other because that's the way how, how to proceed. Because otherwise you can really get tired because you're talking at your university and you feel that no one is listening. But if, if you get back up from, from the networks, then you can get be stronger and see that this is not a futile work. Mm, OK. 
case. Okay. Well, we, t we, we will try to do that. Next question from our audience now, uh, with the precision maybe. Uh, why do you uh, do you not recommend your students to use Wikipedia as a reference? Well, not really. Uh, I, I prefer them to use uh, papers, scientific papers. Wikipedia is not a good source of, uh, um, and we discuss the source, sources and the value of different sources. You can start with the Wikipedia just to orient yourself, but that's not a good source. Well, whoever can write Wikipedia. And we have seen, I've seen Wikipedia articles that are basically hijacked by a certain group of people with certain political interests that they can hijack and really write some things that are not, that are very, yeah, you, you can discuss if, they are, if there's any truth in it. So this is not a good source of uh, reliable source. So you think that Wikipedia is a starting point, maybe, right, for a student if they only start uh, diving into a question, uh, but then they start to go further and they should go further beyond the Wikipedia. If they do not go further, then uh, the quality of the research is not good, right? I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, to, to, to sum up. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not. It's, it's that Wikipedia is definitely not enough. It's not. It's not a good source. You have to go to scientific articles, and I think it's very good to connect education and research quite early, so that students learn how to read scientific texts quite early. Actually, you can start earlier than you think, but you have to discuss with your students how they should read these texts. What does it mean? And look at these scientific texts in your own uh, discipline and look at referencing technique. So use these scientific texts to learn your students how to read, to point to them how other uh, researchers are using references. What does it mean when you have things in brackets with the last name and the year? What does it mean when you have, a, uh, when you, when this, you have this, uh, words like analyzes or discusses, uh, what does it mean? Because students, you can't just assume your students know how to read, knows, know how to read the scientific texts. So, so you work with those texts. So you can start using scientific texts quite early. So then in that case, they won't need Wikipedia to find out the information. Uh, um, okay, thank you. Another question, the following. You said there are very uh, few technical means to assess the text and they are not enough. And I completely agree with you on that point. But in our experience, uh, we we see that quite a lot of uh, teachers want to have uh, you know, like a ruler, uh, a universal tool just to measure the text, uh, to assess the text and uh, to say yes or no. And uh, our conclusion is that we need uh, not only to uh, raise awareness among students, uh, but also to inform teachers and academic staff uh, uh, on how to um, to work uh, correctly with text, to work, work with students, uh, you know, in this new information reality. Uh, what is your uh, Swedish uh, um, experience? Do you teach something new to your um, teachers? Yeah, yes, we, we teach quite a lot. Uh, students start at early age, already in elementary school discussing the value of sources and have, uh, whenever they write small papers, even in elementary school and definitely in secondary education, they have a discussion about sources. What sources did I use? Are these sources reliable or not? And that's a way to teach your students uh, and pupils uh, to, to develop critical thinking. 
because that's very important today. It's more important because it's very easy to, to, to find the information today. You have it in your cell phone. What you don't have is uh, the ability to, to, to see whether this information is correct or not. Especially today when we have so many false news, fake news, then, then it's, really, um, uh, it's really hard for people to distinguish. And you can see this today with vaccination debate, for instance, uh, how it works. Well, yes, we see this debate. We uh, we still uh, see this uh, discussion. It's a nightmare become reality. Um, a lot of people uh, doubt the effic the efficiency of the the vaccine. Well, let's let's uh, set this aside for now. <laughs> uh, maybe the last question. Uh, from our practice this year, um, my colleagues uh, um, spoke at the INAI conference and we discussed the translated plagiarism. Do you deal with this kind of plagiarism, uh, the translation, uh, or any violations related to the translated text? To, uh, your students maybe did something or your colleagues have some experience with that. Uh, Yes, uh, well, for students, uh, first of all, uh, some students make a mistake because uh, we tell them all the time, write in your own words. And then they translate something and they think, okay, I translated it with my own words, so do I need a reference or not? So that's the first thing. Try to, those students, that's inadvertent plagiarism I'm talking about. Then you have this deliberate plagiarism when they just go find the text in English, translate it into Swedish, go to Google Translate in the worst case. So it's really a bad translation as well. And they, they give you that text uh, and it happens. Uh, and uh, it's very important to discuss with teachers that this might happen. A good advice for teacher, if the text matching software doesn't react on that, is to go back to Google Translate, retranslate the text back to English in this case, and then send that text through the text matching software and see if there's anything. Uh, hopefully teachers are reading quite a lot and have the knowledge and can recognize things quite well. Um, you can't rely on text matching software too much because it's just a tool. It just shows you text matching. It's still, I, I'm pretty allergic when people call it, call it anti-plagiarism. It's not anti-plagiarism. It's not ill plagiarism tool or plagiarism detection. It's still you teacher that have the responsibility. It's just a tool that helps you and makes your life a bit easier. But don't rely on that too much. Translations are one example. Thank you, Sonia, for this uh, speech, uh, for the detailed answers that you gave us.